There we go. Thank you for that. And um, somebody told me I was on mute. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the Resident and Family Support Council meeting that we have on the second and the fourth Friday of every month at three o'clock. Um, the meeting link that you use to come to today's meeting is the same link that we use for every meeting. So share that link with family, friends, and anybody who you feel may be interested in learning more about this whole long-term care world, because it's a very complicated world, as our speaker today is going to share more with us about this. Um, and just, um, I do want to give a shout out to the Illinois Pioneer Coalition for allowing us to use their Zoom platform. Thank you to the Illinois Pioneer Coalition for that, so that we can bring these meetings to you um, on that second and the fourth Tuesday of every month. These meetings are um, devised to be able to empower people with information because we really do firmly believe that the more information that people have, the better they can do in navigating long-term care and be able to be more empowered with making sure that you're getting what it is that you need, want, and deserve. And our speaker today, Eric, Eric Carlson um, is with Justice on Aging. And I'm, can you, I'm hearing there might be a lot of, I got to close my window in a minute, Eric, as soon as I get you started. Um, there's somebody mowing the lawn. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but Eric is here today from the Justice in Aging, and he is um, a, a very well versed in this long term care world and knows what issues exist. And, you know, he's devised some really great materials on how to overcome these problems. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us today. We so appreciate you being here. Oh, thanks for the invite. I'm Eric, happy. Did you want to share your slides or did you want me to share those? I can. I can share them. I think we can we can maybe take 10, 15 seconds here to set them up and then I'll be happy to to move them myself. Great. OK, so, perfect. Perfect. So, okay. Yes. Well, Eric, while you're setting it up, do you want to just share a little bit about who you are and what brought you to this conversation? Sure. <clears throat> I've been doing this work for for decades and I work for Justice in Aging. We're a national organization that focuses on protecting the interests of older Americans, particularly those with few resources. And my particular focus is on long-term service and supports, which includes nursing facilities, which includes assisted living, and which includes home and community-based services. And my colleagues work on a variety of areas. There's certainly a lot of focus on public benefits, a lot of Medicaid focus, focus on SSI, Supplemental Security Income, people that do housing work. And the um, work that we do includes education like this, but also administrative advocacy, particularly in D.C. with CMS, the Social Security Administration, legislative advocacy in Congress, litigation in various forums, um, uh, a whole variety of, of other things. We try to use our skills as lawyers to make life better for for older Americans. So if you give me 10, 15 seconds here, I will um, see if I can share the share my own screen if I can get permission. Well, you're doing that. I just wanted to share this real quickly while you're just um this here is um, I wanted to just make people aware, and I don't know if you're going to be talking about this. Um, I'll share it at the end because it's ha I'm having a hard time getting this to share. But we have a link um, available for everybody with the new staffing standards. CMS has announced new staffing standards um, that they are putting up for review for people to comment. So we have a link for people to be able to hold their iPhone up or their smartphone up to the link to be able to um, make comment, read it, and then make comments on that. So we wanted to make sure that everybody felt empowered to be able to do that. Um, there are a, There's a lot going on in our federal government side, and we appreciate the work that Justice and Aging does to really make sure that the residents that live in long-term care are fully represented um, in that voice so that it's 
that, that people are really understanding the needs of people who live in long-term care. So uh, that's one of the um, wonderful things about justice and aging that they um, really do make sure that there is a justice in aging. So it's a perfect title for the name of this organization. And, and hey, Lee, mm -hmm. uh, so can you talk more about exactly what the what the rule is that CMS is trying to put through, like specifically on the staffing standards? I I actually am not versed in um, exactly what is going on there because there's a lot where there's a meeting tomorrow that I'll be attending um, that the consumer voice is having and this link that I'm going to share with everybody which I can put up at the end um, will um, is a and also Karen if you're on I think you have access to those links on um, the consumer voice. Uh, meeting that is tomorrow, they're going to be going through all of those. So there's a lot of documents out there to read right now. Um, and I've skimmed through them, but I haven't poured through them so that I could speak well on as to what is going on with those staffing standards. So I, I think I can answer the question if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. And, and let me just get verification. Um, do we have the proper screen sharing at this point? Yes, you should be able to share your screen. And, and you see that the... the the slide Sorry. is comp. No, nope. I'm, I'm doing it now. Sorry, something happened where it didn't. Okay, so you should be able to share now. There we go. We see it now. Okay, okay terrific. Okay. Okay. Well, let me let me first um talk about the the question about mm -hmm. the federal staffing regulations that there's been consumer pressure for decades really to establish some and I don't know what this if there's separate state standards in Illinois but under the federal law there's no firm staffing standards the federal law says you need to have a um, registered nurse at least eight hours a day and you need to have certified nurse aides, but and you need to have nursing coverage around the clock, but it doesn't say anything about the overall staffing levels, like particularly um, how many nurse aides you might have per per resident. And so that is what these federal reg regulations, these proposed federal regulations address for the very first time. It's something that the Biden administration promised to do when they announced their nursing facility initiative in the front part of 2022. And then those proposed regulations were just released to the public a week or two ago. They're open for public comment up until the, a day in the first week of November. So people are encouraged to, to comment. The, the general take, I think, from what you'll hear in the webinar tomorrow is that the intent is good or just the, the idea of having set standards is really positive. It's just that the standards that the government has proposed may be um, insufficient. Um, and that's and that's maybe enough. I, I do think folks are encouraged to comment. Um, watching the webinar tomorrow, I think, would be extremely, extremely useful because the whole thing is very important. This is an opportunity that's people have been waiting for for decades really and if we're going to have if and when we're going to have these standards it's important that they be meaningful so, so thank you thank you for sharing that synopsis we do appreciate that so thank you so with that we'll, we'll go to the discussion of common nursing home problems this starts with the federal nursing home reform law which um, applies across the country, which allows me to, to talk to folks in Illinois or Nevada or Alabama or, or Connecticut um, because it's the, it's the same law. It protects anybody resident of a nursing facility as long as that nursing facility accepts federal money, Medicare or Medicaid. And so that's it basically it means it's covers just about every resident in the in the country because as you know, Every 
every facility or just about every facility, except <laughs> Medicare or Medicaid or both. There's a very tiny, narrow sliver of facilities that has such a wealthy clientele that they don't have to worry about Medicare and Medicaid. But again, that's one facility out of 200 maybe. Um, and then it applies to every resident in the facility, regardless of payment source. So it's tied to the certification for Medicare or Medicaid, but it protects residents, um, even if those residents aren't being reimbursed through Medicare or Medicaid or paying out of pocket, for example, or through a a um, private long-term care insurance policy. The core principles I limited to two. One is that the facility essentially has to meet the resident's needs. Okay? The basic principle that says the facility has to provide services so that the resident can attain or maintain the highest practicable level of functioning. Also, extremely important principle, is that there can't be discrimination based on payment source. That specifically means that there shouldn't be discrimination against Medicaid eligible residents. So you shouldn't hear a facility say, well, we, we won't do that because this person is eligible for Medicaid. Every resident should get the same care regardless of the reimbursement source. That is always how it, it, um, it works out. And there is a lot of bad practices, illegal practices in nursing facilities. And we encourage people to um, to advocate for themselves and to and to push back. A lot of cases, facilities say things that just aren't true. And that was the genesis of this guide that we've written, 25 Common Nursing Home Problems and How to resolve them. For each of these 25 common problems, there is listed the false statement that the nursing facility will likely say, the law that actually applies, and then an explanation of what the resident and the resident's advocate should do to get the resident the care or um, treatment or freedom that he or she is entitled to. It's a free download on our website, and um, it's possible it's been circulated to you as part of the materials for this discussion today. So this presentation today is largely comprised of pieces from those 25 common problems. These are some common problems, and just as in, is in the case of the guide, I've organized them by and large with the false statement from the nursing facility on the left, and then the true statement of law on the right. First false statement is the facility claiming that the family member has to pay, or that has to sign up to be liable. In this case, the statement that the resident's daughter has to sign the admission agreement as a responsible party. The truth of that matter is that the facility is prohibited from getting an agreement which would make a third party financially liable. You can't get a third party guarantee of payment. You, they can't require it and they can't request it. Now, it doesn't mean that there may not be a signature of a family member or friend. What it means is that when there is a signature of the family member or friend, that has to be only to represent the resident. So the the daughter, in our example, can sign as the agent for her mother, but what she can't do is sign on her own behalf or sign as a quote-unquote responsible party. Responsible party is a particularly devious term. When consumers see it, they'll likely think, well, I don't want to be irresponsible. Or if something happens, I want the facility to, to call me and let me know what's going on. What they don't realize necessarily is that somewhere in that agreement, responsible party is defined as somebody who is financially responsible. And that's what's inappropriate because as I just mentioned a minute ago, federal law prohibits a nursing facility from requiring or requesting a third party guarantee of payment. Um, 
some facilities will still, regardless of this law, again, there's frequent non-compliance. Facilities will still try to get away with holding a family member responsible. And the facility should generally lose. The facility might claim, for example, this is a, a frequent attempt to do an end around on the law. They may complain that it's not a financial guarantee, that they're just suing the family member because the family member didn't um, handle the resident's affairs appropriately. But um, that argument should generally fail, except in those rare cir circumstances where you know, if a family member really is just looting the residence money and not paying in the facility, the judge is likely going to be more sympathetic towards the facility. But otherwise, in general, and, and court rulings are never a guarantee, but in general, the resident should win. In any of those situations, if, if you find yourself in this situation, then first of all, uh, avoid signing these admission agreements. Make sure all, if, if you, that you sign only as an agent, never taking on a financial responsibility. And then secondly, if you are sued on one of these, you need to get legal counsel and recognize that you probably have some pretty solid defenses. People might say, well, what do you mean? How do, you, how do I not sign something? They give it to me. Then I have to sign it. Um, you can explain why the provisions are illegal. Strike out the the improper provisions, um, and particularly if the resident's already in the facility, there's no there's no risk that there's um, grounds for eviction. Don't include disputes about the admission agreement, and so at that point, there's really not a lot the facility can do. But in general, in these matters, and in in general, in, in all of these matters, the overarching advice is. Be a little assertive. Don't think, well, I don't want to create a ruckus here. Um, it seems like I'm pushing the envelope a little bit. That's okay. You should be pushing the envelope. And I think by pushing on the envelope a little bit, um, you may be pleasantly surprised. Um, the facility employees don't necessarily understand what's going on here. They're just going through the motions as well. And if you're able to demonstrate that you know as much or more than they do, you're generally in pretty solid shape. The next step, well, assuming that the admission agreement issues have been resolved now, is a care planning discussion of the resident once he or she enters the facility. The misstatement is that the nursing facility and the nurses will just figure out the care that the resident's going to get. And initially, a resident or family member might think, well, um, of course, right? I'm a, these are medical people. Who am I to um, to say what's supposed to happen? Actually, that's not true. This isn't a hospital. It's it's where somebody is living, where and potentially for weeks, for months, for years. So the care plan, much of it isn't about the exact medical treatment or compliance with physician orders. It's about how you how you live your life. And what you what you do during the day and the activities you want to do and the and the rehab that you may may need and other issues as well. The federal law recognizes that and states that the resident and the residence agent have a right to participate in the development of a care plan. Language is really good here. You see the mention of a comprehensive person-centered care plan. It's supposed to focus on the on the resident on that person not the needs of the of the facility just as is shown by this definition here person centered means exactly what the term suggests and the federal regulations establish that the resident has a right as is described here to receive services with reasonable accommodation of resident needs and preferences so they have to reasonably accommodate if you say I don't want to wake up until nine, or I, you know, I want to wake up just when I when I choose to wake up. That's reasonable. Same thing. I want to go to bed at seven, or I want to go to bed at, at midnight, or I want to get out during the day. I want to get on the block a couple times during the day. Whatever it is, um, the question is whether it's it's reasonable, and if it's in a reasonable accommodation, the facility should be willing to, to change its preferences, its policies rather to honor the preferences 
of the resident. All this is documented in this comprehensive person-centered care plan has to be done within seven days of the initial assessment. And this care planning team includes the facility staff, includes also the resident, the resident's representative, and um, anybody else that the resident wants to include in this process. Some other mandatory folks include the physician, the registered nurse, some other some other people as well. Just in general, I encourage residents and their families to take advantage of this. A lot of times in practice, these care planning meetings can be a little bit pro forma. The resident, the, the family get a notice that says, we'll have a care planning meeting on 1030 next Wednesday morning. And people show up and they're just not really prepared to advocate for much. And the facility has some pre-printed care plans based on the resident's medical, medical needs and everybody signs off and that's the end of it. I encourage people instead to think a little bit more aggressively. From the resident's point of view, what do I want? Right? What, what do I want? I, this facility, either I'm paying thousands of dollars out of pocket, somebody's paying thousands of dollars every single month for me to be here. What do I want about living my life or, you know, or activities or getting out of the facility or, um, or food or visiting or anything? Um, people should make those asks. The facility has an obligation to accommodate them if reasonable, and it should all be documented in the, in the care plan. What you also could see when the care plan would be activities. The misstatement from the facility might be, well, we've done all we can. Look, we've got a, got a big TV in the corner. We got bingo three times a week, some other pro forma thing. The regulations and the surveyor's guidelines also, and um, let's just give a reference to the surveyor's guidelines here. Their appendix PP, the letter P twice to the state operations manual. If you just put appendix PP in a Google search, it comes right up. It's there can be really useful. They um, list the federal regulations, but there's also pages and pages and pages of discussion of how to implement those federal regulations. And so you can, you can, if you're in an advocacy position, you can oftentimes find some some really assist um, helpful language from those um, surveyors guidelines. So, um, and this is an example, if you look under activities, you know, there's a discussion about some of the th things that the facility could do um, to make activities really useful. Here's the regulatory language. It's it's really strong based on the assessment and care plan, support the rest, since they're in their choice of activities, which may surprise would may be surprised it includes it individual activities or independent activities. So it's not just limited to big group things where the um, facility works with or provides services to a couple dozen people at a time. They also have some obligation to, to help support people, some individual things they might want to do because like, like any of us in nursing facility residents, maybe sometimes they'll want to be together with five or 10 or 15 other people, but some other times, they want to may want to be just by themselves doing an individual activity, and a facility has an obligation to help make that happen. If that's what the the resident want, there's also an obligation to assist people in getting access to the broader community. Here you you see a citation to the particular relevant surveyors guidelines, and mentions the as you see possibility of getting out and shopping, attending the theater, concerts, community groups. For some residents, it doesn't make any sense, but for some residents, it it does. And just note that that facilities obligations include the obligation to help the resident access the community in this way. Sometimes there's this false sense that once people are in a nursing facility, well, that's it. There are the four walls. Maybe they can get out to the patio every so often, but that's it inappropriate under the federal regulations and the server surveyors guidelines 
There's also in the surveyor's guidelines, some discussions about activities for particular subpopulations. Again, it's not one size fits all. It's not just always watching television. It's not just playing bingo. It also may be activities that are particularly appropriate to these groups listed here. Um, those folks with dementia or who are withdrawn or folks who are having delusions. It's gotta be, again, where we started on one of the early slides, person-centered, recognizing that we're dealing with individual people here. We're gonna talk about some Medicaid and Medicare related issues as well. Um, this first one goes back to that early principle I'd mentioned. The falsehood is, <clears throat> The Medicaid doesn't pay for individual attention during meals, right? You can't have one-on-one -on -one assistance. <clears throat> That's not true. Remember, remember the other principle, which says the facility has to provide the care that's necessary. And so in this case, the resident facility has to provide the care that's necessary and has to provide it without regard to payment source. And so if the resident needs one-on-one -on -one attention in order to eat, even if the resident is Medicaid eligible, that's what the resident has to, to get. Here's a particular regulatory citation that requires that the facility have, quote, identical policies and practices regarding provision of services, regardless of, of payment source. This um, will be seen as controversial by, by some facilities. They are very accustomed to providing lesser services and blaming it on the Medicaid rate. They'll say, well, how, what can you expect? Medicaid only pays us so much per day. And for each Medicaid resident, we're supposedly losing each day $5.39. Well, they shouldn't be making that argument. They have no legal right to excuse their poor performance based on the reimbursement rate. We think of any of us in the jobs that we might do. When we do those jobs, if somebody complains, we don't say, well, of course I'm doing a terrible job because I'm not getting not getting paid enough. That's not how it works. That just like I have an obligation and, and you all may have obligations to, to do your job. Same thing of the nursing facility. And it's particularly unfair in this situation because they're not forced to accept Medicaid. It's a choice. It's a voluntary choice. And they ha have taken up that choice and they have told the federal government, yes, and the state government, yes, we will accept Medicaid. We understand what the rate is and we will accept Medicaid, accept Medicaid eligible individuals, and we will provide them the necessary care. But then after doing that, they're turning around and telling the residents, well, yeah, we accept the money, uh, but we're telling you that we don't consider it enough. And so we're going to shortchange you in this, that, or the other way. Entirely inappropriate. You hear sometimes falses regarding visit visitation rights, or particularly visiting, so called visiting hours. This false statement here says visiting hours um, close at 8 p.m. at night. Not true that visiting hours under the federal regulations are 24 hours a day. Um, the resident has a right to, you see in the slide, immediate access. Um, the only limitation is this particular regulatory limitation in the second black bullet point applicable to non-family visitation. So again, it all, this limitation only applies to non-family visitation and it limits it based on clinical and safety restrictions. Then the surveyor's guidelines, there's some detail about these restrictions, clinical and safety restrictions, a relatively narrow category, infect, infective, infection related rather, um, suspect, suspicions of abuse, theft. And the, the big message here is people should be able to accept visitors around the clock and the facility's ability to 
rule out particular people as, as potential visitors is extremely limited. Only applies to some really narrow situations for non-family member visitors. The next couple of false statements deal with restraints, both physical and then and, and chemical. The physical is the, the more straightforward one. Um, the misstatement might be, we have to use restraints. We have to tie up your mom or dad and you know, put a vest around them and tie it to the chair, whatever the restraint might be, because supposedly without it, the resident's going to fall. Um, the truth is, a couple truths, the facilities can't be used for convenience. And as I'll mention and emphasize here in a minute, the choice has to be the, the residence. There has to be consent to restraints. The regulations, first of all, limit this by making it clear that the restraints can't be used for convenience. Right? Can't be used just because it makes it easier the facility. Has to be done for the resident's interest. And then recognize that like any kind of medical intervention, you need informed consent. The resident has to say, yes, this is okay. So from an advocacy perspective, I would suggest that you don't have to prove that the restraints are used for convenience or not for convenience. It doesn't matter. All you need to do to avoid the restraints is for the resident or the resident's representative to say, I don't want these. I don't consent. It's the resident's choice. And um, if the resident refuses, or doesn't consent, then um, the facility doesn't have any right to, to impose those restraints. And then the same thing is true for what we consider chemical restraints, which are the administration of sedat sedating medications. The false statement the facility says, well, we don't have a choice. We've got to do this to make this resident more manageable. The law says the medication can only be used to address an illness. And again, consent is is required. Usually in these conversations, we're talking about psychotropics or a subcategory of psych psychotropics, the, the antipsychotics that again are tend to be used to sedate residents. The regulation says that they get, can only be used if they're necessary. Again, not for not for convenience, but if they're needed to treat a particular condition of the the resident. And in any case, just like the physical restraints, it's all predicated on consent. The resident has to sign off on it, just like any other um, administration of medication. I No one can forcibly medicate me unless I consent. So the same thing is true here. If I, if I don't consent to a medication, I can't be, shouldn't be given that medication. And from an advocacy perspective, just like the physical restraints, I think that's the, the way to go. You don't have to meet the burden of establishing that something was done for the facility's convenience or that it was it was a need to address a particular medical problem. The simpler thing is just to focus on the consent. Either the resident has consented or the resident hasn't consented. If the resident hasn't consented, then um, the facility can't impose the restraint, whatever it is. Or, or if it's if this already is being imposed, what you may want to do is have a clear statement from the resident or the resident's representative that they do not consent. A statement that says, I do not wish to have physical restraints. I do not wish to have this particular medication. If you, the facility, are administering it, regardless, you are breaking the regulations. Um, committee battery, however this you may want to phrase it in the in the particular position communicated to the to the facility. We'll discuss some Medicare related falsehoods here. The facility says in this false statement that the facility is determined that Medicare won't pay. Not quite right. It's not a 
a Medicare determination, what's going on right there. What's happening is the facility is making an affirmative decision not to submit a bill. And under the law, the resident can require the facility to submit a bill to the Medicare program. And this is fee-for-service Medicare. We're not talking about managed care Medicaid, Medicare here. This is this is fee-for-service, although the, the managed care rules are similar and that they provide appellate rights. So in this case, the, um, the facility says we're not going to bill um, and that... Um, this is the language from this, the Medicare notice that the facility, quote, believes that the care listed below does not meet the coverage requirements. Again, they're essentially saying we're choosing not to bill. Um, some more details on this non-coverage. Uh, fair amount of information that has to be included. And then the resident has a choice in this notice of checking one of these boxes. I want this care and I want Medicare to be billed. I want the care, but I do not want Medicare to be billed. And so, and then thirdly, I don't want the care. So if people um, want to pursue further Medicare coverage, what they would do in this case would be check the top box. It says, I want the care and I want a, a bill to be submitted. And we'll talk about the standards in a, in a second here. You know, that's generally the right, if they're, resident believes that he or she has a credible claim for coverage, that's the right thing to do. Sometimes facilities are a little bit squeamish in submitting requests for Medicare coverage, even though it's their preferred reimbursement rate. And so they'll need a, a nudge from the resident. And once they get that nudge and when they once they've submitted, they will work harder to justify the the, the claim. Um, Let's um, before this next falsehood, let me just sketch out the the standards for Medicare coverage. It doesn't last forever. It's a post acute benefit. The um, as opposed to Medicaid, for example, Medicaid may pay indefinitely because a person has run out of money, and if they need a nursing facility care, Medicare will Medicaid rather will keep on paying. But Medicare is based on a post-acute benefit coming out of a hospitalization of at least three nights and then requiring skilled services subsequently. The first 20 days could be paid in full. Days 21 through 100 have a daily, is a daily co-payment of a couple hundred dollars, 200, 200 dollars. The Skilled care that's required is not just, for example, a need to have some medication administered or something like just like routine nursing facility care. It has to be something above and beyond the ordinary, either something that requires the really significant attention from a, of a nurse, maybe monitoring the resident's recovery from something, but, but something that really is requires intensive nursing for care or more commonly rehabilitative services on a daily or almost daily basis. It's be physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. So, and, and people don't get a hundred days uh, or close to it. What they get on average is right around 28 days. And the reason that they don't get the full 100 days is that they're deemed not to require these skilled services beyond whatever the limit might be for them. For some people, their Medicare coverage ends after 10 or 15 days. For some people, it's 20, 25. Some people, it's 40, 50. And then in the rare cases, someone will be deemed to require that skill level of care for the entire 100 days. So with that as the setting the stage here, we can talk about this next falsehood, which is Medicare's claim that it won't pay, the facility's claim rather, that Medicare won't pay because the resident supposedly has plateaued in therapy. That is wrong for a, a couple of reasons. First of all, that the care should be provided whenever the person needs it. And second of all, improvement isn't required under Medicare. We'll do these in order. Like I mentioned, again, principle number one, 
facility has to provide the care that's necessary. And you have to, and it shouldn't be based on reimbursement source. So if the resident needs therapy services, let's say physical therapy, the resident should get physical therapy. And um, resident likely has a good claim for coverage of this under Medicare. Facilities may claim that the person has plateaued or they're not improving. That is actually wrong. This language in the brown here is language from the federal regulations, which as you see says that the restoration potential is not the deciding factor in determining whether skilled services are needed. So whether whether they're going to uh, whether the person's going to recover to a certain level isn't the issue. Um, the person may need skilled services just to maintain their current condition, for example, or to keep the level of decline relatively limited. Um, I mentioned this Jimmo litigation. That's litigation that emphasize this regulatory right. The regulation has been there forever. The GMO litigation is more recent. It was brought because the system wasn't honoring this, this regulation. And because of the GMO litigation against the federal government, the federal government puts out more precise notices now and has this right better documented in their manuals is taken various steps to make sure that in real life, people aren't in a position of losing their Medicare nursing facility coverage because supposedly they've plateaued. If you go on the internet, you can relatively quickly find these resources. That um, There's a CMS website, settlement agreement, some fact sheet. Also, if you go to the Center for Medicare Advocacy. They were co-counsel on this case and their website also has a tremendous amount of information on this, this issue. Another related Medicare issue, when someone's Medicare ends, let's say appropriately in this case, that they no longer require skilled services, oftentimes nursing facilities then at that point will try to move them to a different room or in some cases, just try to move them out of facility completely. The worst facilities do something like this in a very cynical sort of scheme. Because they prefer Medicare reimbursement, they'll bring in residents under Medicare. They like the, the Medicare payment rate. And then after a few weeks, whatever it is, when Medicare ends, they try to um, ship them to some other nursing facility. That is wrong for a variety of reasons. First, the resident even shouldn't be moved within a facility. The facility may say, well, you, you can't stay in a Medicare bed. Um, that bed is not limited to Medicare eligible people. It may be one that's appropriate for Medicare, but it's not um, in many cases, um, in most cases limited to Medicare certification and um, a resident can has a right to refuse a transfer within a facility if the purpose is to move the resident out of a Medicare certified room. There are some issues in some states. I'm so, sorry, I don't know Illinois off the top of my head um, where the facility may present some complications if only certain beds are certified for Medicaid, but absent that, um, the resident has a right to refuse a transfer within the facility if the purpose is to move the resident out of a Medicare certified room. And um, in any case, it is never in any state appropriate for the facility to just try to move the resident out of the entire facility. Entirely inappropriate. Facilities don't have the right to just extract Medicare from people. Um, and, and then um, push them out. If once the resident is in the facility, the resident can only be quote unquote evicted for a limited number of reasons. And um, finishing out your Medicare eligibility 
is not one of those reasons. It is possible at that point the resident may be transferring from Medicare coverage to Medicaid or from Medicare to private pay. That's fine. The resident has a right to change forms of payment, and that's not grounds for eviction. As you will see from the next couple of slides here, these relate to transfer and discharge. Uh, let's assume here that the resident says that rather the facility says that the resident has to leave because the resident is quote unquote difficult. Actually, eviction is allowed only for six limited reasons, and they're listed right here. The first two relate to the resident's care needs. Either resident needs a higher level of care, something beyond a nursing facility, or a lesser level of care, doesn't need nursing facility care and be fine in, in some sort of assisted living facility, for example. Numbers three and four relates to endangerment. Supposedly, the resident's president endangers the safety or health of others. Five is fairly straightforward, non-payment. And then six, the facility going out of a business. But recognize that it should be narrow. The difficulty doesn't qualify. It's not that resident is a problem or, or um, you know, is, is belligerent or disruptive or, or requires a lot of attention. All those things, none of those things qualify a resident for eviction. And for good reason, because these are nursing facilities. People are in nursing facilities because they need they need help, right? They need us. They need assistance. And when I did do direct service, um, I defended a lot of these. And in most cases, the facility was just going after somebody it was usually Medicaid eligible. It also was just difficult in some way. It required a lot of attention. Um, maybe had significant dementia. Uh, maybe had had some family matters that family members that just kept getting in disputes. Whatever it is, and the facility would try to evict, and the facility would always lose because maybe the resident is difficult or presents problems or whatnot. But that's what the facility is paid to deal with, and those situations didn't come close to meeting one of these conditions. One through, one through six. As I mentioned, non-payment is one of these reasons, and the facility might say, well, "We're not getting paid right now. You're here. Your Medicaid isn't finalized yet. You've applied, but it's not finalized. There's non-payment, and you have to leave. That is inappropriate. The facility has to wait for the." Medicaid decision. And this is the definition of non-payment in the federal regulations. And you'll see um, it, it applies if the resident does not submit the necessary paperwork for third-party payment. Uh, but then that means that if the resident has submitted that paperwork, the facility has to wait because it's not non-payment at that point. So if you're in that situation, the facility has to, to hold tight until the Medicaid agency makes the decision. At that point, there's either payment or, or non-payment. Sometimes, as I mentioned, facilities try to extract Medicare coverage from people and then send them on their the way. Um, so you you will see in situations like like this in real life where the facility gives the impression that once the person's Medicare coverage ends, they've got to leave immediately because quote unquote they're, they're they can't stay in a Medicare bed. That's not right. Under the transfer discharge rules, under the eviction rules, the facility has to give notice and and wait for a hearing. This hearing is in excuse me. This notice is in writing. It's generally 30 days prior to the date of proposed transfer discharge, although there's some limited exceptions. And then the notice has to list all the things here. The reason, you know, why is it? Is it non-payment? Is it endangerment? What is it? The effective date, which again should be at least 30 days in the future, where the person that would be transferred to, the appeal rights, and then advocacy information, contact info for the ombudsman or other relevant relevant advocacy organizations. Um, and you have 
the right to an administrative hearing. When it talks about appeal rights there, you have a right within the state to a hearing in front of an administrative law judge where the facility presents its case and the resident can, can respond. Um, this slide here is just the point that I made a couple of times already that that the facility, the resident has a right to stay even after the Medicare has ended. And then here, if the facility claims that they have sole discretion to figure this out, actually not true. There's an administrative law judge that hears these cases. There's no transfer discharge while the appeal is, is pending. Um, let's talk a little bit about advocacy strategies. The first seems obvious, and it's real, but it's really important, and um, and many people don't follow it. The first rule is don't move out in these cases. That how many times, in my experience and other advocates' experience, residents get these eviction notices and then immediately panic and think, "Oh, I've got to go someplace," and they they feel the clock ticking immediately and scramble around and go someplace else, and sometimes maybe after a week or two, they'll think better of it and call up somebody like me or some other legal services type. And um, we tell them at that point that, well, it's a little too late for that. If you're going to fight an eviction, you really have to stay and fight it. If you just pick up and move, you have capitulated. And there's, in most cases, there's nothing the advocate can do at that point. So that's the first rule. And, it is, and if you're advising people, you just tell them, hang tight, you'll, you'll be fine. Um, a lot of people have gone through this before. Um, you probably, you'll probably win. You, um, It's important to assert yourself. And there's no guarantee that facility number two is gonna be any better necessarily. Um, if you win, they're gonna treat you with more respect, all of those, all of those things. And then within the advocacy itself, let's say you're at a hearing, you don't want, the facility to put all the blame on the resident. So one of the examples that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, we're talking about a difficult resident. The facility is going to be prepared to say oh, how terrible this resident is, that they were trying to get the resident ready for dinner and he didn't cooperate. And then at dinner time, he made a mess and got in a fight with somebody. What, whatever it might be, the advocate's response to that is, well, that's what that's what residents with dementia do. It's your nursing facility, right? There's, there's no, nobody's endangered here. This is just a run-of-the-mill situation in a nursing facility. And in some cases, point out mistakes that the facility has made, mistakes in their staffing, their, their failure to care plan. Remember we talked about care planning? way at the beginning of this discussion, when this problem presented itself, Ms. Nursing Facility Administrator, you didn't care plan, did you? You didn't you didn't go back to assessment. You didn't you didn't talk to the physician. You didn't talk to your staff people. You didn't do any of those things. Instead you moved immediately to evict, right? To point out what they should have done, what what proper nursing care should have been, and to emphasize that they didn't didn't do that. So my experience has been, it varies a little bit from state to state, but residents should win the majority of these because they're not really, again, endangering anybody. They're not a, appropriate for some subacute level of care. They're entirely appropriate for a nursing facility. They may be a little more challenging than the normal resident. I, I may concede that, but so what? That is, they have perfect right to stay in the in the facility. Sometimes facilities try to cheat a little bit in these evictions. And um, instead of evicting people with notice, they wait until they're in the hospital and then refuse to let them back in. Um, that is inappropriate. Uh, this, I didn't fix this slide. The reference to New Jersey obviously is inappropriate here. You have to give a notice of bed hold policy. Um, there's, a, there's a different policy in, in Illinois. I apologize for that oversight. And then regard, in addition to the bed hold, there's a right under federal law to return to the next available room in the facility. So regardless of how long you're 
you're away, even if you're away for a month or two um, in the hospital, you have the right to go back to the facility to the next availability and to go back to the exact same room, assuming that room is available. Um, and so with that, I, I'm happy. I, I know we're coming up on the hour mark. Um, I'd be happy to discuss any any piece of it, but I want to emphasize that it's just so, it, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I know all you folks are interested in these issues and engaged. It's it's so essential residents do get taken advantage of, and um, you have a tremendous amount of, of power here to to tilt the to tilt the balance of power and to to stand up for residents and to and to raise these issues. And um, if I or anybody else in justice and aging can help you at any point, please let us know. Thank you so much, Eric. I mean, this was really great information, particularly, you know, the advice that you give, because we use that advice a lot. Um, don't move out when that eviction notice is happening. Stay. Stay and make sure you just don't leave. I mean, that's it's just such an easy thing to be able to remember. Um, and we say this to people all the time. So we really do appreciate everything um, that you shared with us today because it's all really, really important information. If anybody does have a question, do feel free to either type it into the chat or you can put your hand up or you can unmute yourself. Um, and we'd be happy to answer that question. Um, I did want to address a question for you regarding the therapy and not being able to, um, you know, if um, your your therapy, you, um, uh, you uh, they stop Medicare payment on the therapy, but you still feel you need therapy. You It has to be the real need for therapy. It can't be just that feeling that you need therapy, we encounter a lot of those sorts of things. It, it's, a, it's a good question. Let me take an, another minute to elaborate. You know, therapy requires a physician order, mm -hmm. right? So, so oftentimes the advocacy here, there's only so much you can do yourself. The physician has to be on board and the therapist has to be on board, really. And so I have found that that's, it's uh, really important to go to those people, particularly the therapist, because they want to do a good job. And if they believe there's still work to be done with somebody, they don't want to abandon them usually. And so I think it's it's very helpful to, to go to those folks and encourage them a bit, share the law with them a little bit, and um, yeah, encourage them to, to go forward and particularly for the physician to continue authorizing therapy for X number of additional weeks or X number of additional sessions because you need that level of, of leverage. So you do need that because without that, if the physician says, I'm not ordering it, and then in the resident says, I'd really like some, who, you're in trouble because um, my opinion on therapy is the lawyer my client's opinion is not good enough. You're going to need a physician to to give the order for the therapy to be provided. Okay, yeah, because I think that's where some people get a little um, that that piece. It's like, well, I still want it, and the therapist says, no, uh, there, there's no. Yeah, more you're, yeah, you're you're still subject to some medical judgment there, and that is, you you've got to do some advocacy with them as well. Got it. Okay. Wanted to make sure of that. And then I also had um, another question about when you were talking about the restraints, whether physical or chemical restraints, and you said that, um, you know, if the resident doesn't want the consent is what has to happen. So really to focus in on that consent piece, even if you already did sign a consent and you don't want it anymore, like if you had an order of prescription, um, let's say for a psychotropic medication, you didn't want it anymore um, and you want to retract that. Um, does the opposite hold true? We've come across situations where families want a restraint, like let's say a bed rails, and the resident may not be communicative or decisional, and they're the power of attorney or the representative, the resident's representative, and they want the bed rails there. Does that also hold true, that that then would be put into place because of the consent of the person? Yeah, the, the more, good, more good questions. It, you're right. Sometimes the restraint discussion is flipped 
And mm -hmm. it's the facility saying, oh, we don't want to do any restraints. We understand that that's bad stuff. And you're right. Then the family comes in and says, but we want to, we're concerned about the safety of, of mom and dad. So that is a, a common situation. Um, you're still going to, you, you need an order. You need, you need consent. Like whether, what consent, this is always murky when you start talking about capacity and who gets to decide um you know i'd want to say that you like if you look at your average power of attorney document it probably wouldn't include something like this so it's a little hard to generalize but my guess is that a decision like that could still be made by the resident given that you know if he or she had had the power to articulate that even over the the wishes of a of an agent, for example, but that would depend on the language of the power of attorney document itself. Same thing with a guardianship or conservatorship or whatever it might call be called in in um in Illinois. Um my 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 guess is that the the authority of that guardianship, let's say, would in, would include the ability to make a decision like that. Um, but can't be sure. So in, in general, if that's the situation you're talking, if we're, if we're assuming that the family member, if the, if the family member and the resident are at odds, I think is your question, right? If there's no, a, my question so, is why the resident is not communicative. Okay, not communicative. She okay. Make that, cho that cho choice or decision. Yeah. Yeah. yeah then, 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 right. Then the, then the agent, I made that more complicated than needed to be. Yeah. The agent can, the, the consent then falls to the, to the representative. It's cleaner if there's a, a formal power of attorney document or a formal guardianship. But in the absence of that, my experience is it, off, it, it usually states recognize the the nearest family member as the decision maker. I made them more complicated than needed to be. The consent comes, if the resident can't make those decisions, the resident's representative makes those decisions. And so let's, because I, I have heard buildings, you know, communities, long-term care communities um, say in the past, we're restraint free. We're not going to allow bed rails. We don't allow it only for positioning. And they're very, they're good at it. But then that family member does come in and say, but I want the bed rails up on both sides for my mom. She's not communicating. This is what I want for her safety. She's fallen out of bed and it's not right. I am I mean, as advocates and as a building a facility, they need to be educating the family on the bad that bad things happen with bed rails. But could they make the facility do it? And the, even though the facility say no, we don't want to do it. Could the family make that happen? Because they're saying yes, we do. I know this is complicated, but yeah, that's a, situation yeah like. I, I'm almost going to say I'm not. I'm not sure. At least I. It's not. It's not something I want to answer with. <laughs> Um, yeah. without thinking about it because even and even if I think I thought about it for hours I may not have a good, have a good, <laughs> a good answer that one I think is a that one I think is a you know in general you can't tell medical professionals what to do right so in right. general you can't you can't tell a doctor I want I want you to apply leeches on my arm the physician says well that's not good medical practice I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that and um, so arguably Arguably, that no. falls into that same category here. Is that you can't your your medical customers can't force you to provide bad medicine. Um, yeah. and I think particularly if you, if your case was as the provider, is it what if they're asking you to um, to violate federal standards? Let's say you know let's let's say that it would just be for convenience or what you know wasn't necessary for the resident's safety. Um, they would, if, if it was a closer call, then I think it would be a little bit harder. That's, that's about all I can say there. I, I think, I think it's a tricky, it's a tricky one for me right now. Yeah, it is. Cause I know residents have the right to refuse medication. So, you know, it, it, it's all these pieces that do come and it gets very complicated, but I appreciate your honesty with this is a tough one because <laughs> it can be a very, very tough situation. So really appreciate that. And I see that we are over time right now. So I do want to thank you again, Eric, you have been such a lifesaver for us in always responding and doing these meetings. We so much appreciate it. They are very, very helpful. We do have this taped, so it'll be on YouTube. So please do 
um, go ahead and visit this. And this is one of those things where you could even share this with one, with your loved one's community, with your loved ones, you know, with your own building and saying, hey, I have the right to stay here. You know, what? I'm going to show you this video right here and pull up the clip and say, and this is justice in aging. And this guy knows what he's talking about. So use this also as one of your advocacy tools. Use the videos from these meetings for that as well can be very, very helpful. Thank you very, very much. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and I am going to stop the recording. Um,